So in our previous video, we established sort of the idea of the heterozygote that was necessary for a monohybrid cross to occur. And that's what we're going to be continuing to talk about in this next video. So this next video won't necessarily be a flowchart, but more so just an idea-based um, conclusion on the actual cross that Mendel did. So this is uh, a continuation of Mendel's Model 2. But more specifically, we are obviously focusing, uh, and we were focusing on that monohybrid cross that he did. And we established the sort of formation of a heterozygote, right? We were able to create that G, capital G, lowercase g combination through the two parents that each donated one of their gametes, right? They donated one of their gametes to give us this heterozygote monohybrid, okay? But what did Mendel do? The thing that was interesting, the actual cross, let's say now. So we're sort of going to now be start speaking about the actual cross, let's say the actual cross, because everything before this that I just did in the previous video was sort of the, the precursor to this moment right here. This is what we actually want to focus on when we talk about a monohybrid cross. So what you take is the monohybrid that you just formed, and you're going to do is these two simple things. You're going to take two F1 individuals, because remember this guy, this was P, parent generation, this eventually ended up into an F1 generation. The F1 generation is exclusively in capital G, lowercase g. You're going to take two F1 individuals, so you're going to take two of these guys that come from this parent, parent uh, cross, you're going to take two F1 individuals and cross them, sort of self-fertilize them, and cross them to get what is known as the F2. So I'm going to cross these, this with itself, let's say, or with another member that's the same exact genotype. And through this, you're going to now create the world-famous Punnett square. Reginald Punnett was in charge and sort of created this idea of a Punnett square. So you're going to create a Punnett square based off of what we just said here. Take two F1 individuals, aka these guys, and cross them to get F2. So what I'm going to do is the most basic Punnett square possible. And we're going to draw it out um, sort of on the side over here. What we're going to say is, if we have, so our overall goal is to cross G, lowercase g, with what? Another G, lowercase g. But I want to represent this more, let's say, genetically accurate, more accurately in terms of genetics. So what I'm going to do is, if I imagine this being parent one, let's say this is a parent, let's say this is, let's say this is um, dad. And this is mom. Remember, this is now our F2 cross. This is no longer the original parents. These are two different parents now. We're going to cross them. What we're going to have is, um, let's say, gamete, a gamete from the dad. The dad has a possibility of giving you two different gametes, right? He can either give a capital G in one of his sperm cells, or he can give a lowercase g. He can't give both, right? Because it's haploid. All gametes are haploid, so we have to cut this in half, and we have to cut this in half. Same situation for mom. Her egg cell can either be this or this, depending on the way that meiosis happened. But how do we sort of encompass all of this? How do we figure out what the cross is actually going to be like? What are the chances of each of these things happening in the F2 generation? What we do is we sort of label out the idea of the possibilities. So we can say that the sperm from F1, meaning dad, his combination, his ability can be either one half, let's say, mm, I'll say one half G, over here we'll write it, one half G, capital, or he can give, there's a half chance that he gives one half lowercase g, right? Because look, if you cut this in half, you have this and this, and that's what I'm representing here. This is from the sperm itself. So that's our option in terms of the father. So that is what we'll sort of box out over here, like this. So this is what dad can possibly give. But what about mom? In that situation, what we can say is that let's, let's imagine that egg from mom will come over here. We'll say egg from F1. Because remember, this is our F1. This F1 has also this other possibility of giving us one half G and another one half lowercase g. The same exact sort of concept that we just did with dad because we're crossing the same exact individuals together but just one being mom and one being dad. So we've established this. 
me just portion this out like this. So now what you can sort of clearly see is our Punnett square. We have from mom, from the egg, the possibility, 50% chance of giving a capital G, thus the green phenotype, or a 50% chance of giving the lowercase g, thus the yellow phenotype. Same exact situation from the father's gamete, from the sperm. So what we do is we cross these, we multiply, and we figure out that because of this, we now have an offspring that will have a one-fourth chance of being capital G, capital G. Notice how I did one-half times one-half. It gives us one-fourth. This is a cross-multiplication event giving us capital G, capital G. Let's do the same thing here. This is also going to be one-fourth, but this time it's capital G from mom, from the egg, with a lowercase g from the father. Let's do this one. This is another one-fourth, but capital G from the mom, from the dad actually, on this side the sperm, combining with lowercase g over here. And this last option will also be one-fourth, but this time it will be uniquely the lowercase g, lowercase g, because if we cross multiply one-half lowercase g with one-half lowercase g, sort of like that, we get these final options. So, what is the purpose of all this? What does this tell you? This tells you Mendel's amazing, amazing final ratio of a 3 to 1 phenotypic ratio, which I'll prove to you right now. Final things you should get away from this cross, from this actual cross of two F1 individuals. This is an F1 individual, the sperm, right over here. And this is the egg from the F1. This is mom. This is dad. Two of them crossing together and giving us these final results. Sort of the things that are inside this box right here will be our final results. So this is a possible offspring, this is a possible offspring, this is a possible offspring, and so is that. So the final results that we get from this are a couple of different things. First, let's look at the genotypic results. So the genotypes that are possible out of this sort of cross, this mono-hybrid cross that Mendel did, are one-fourth, capital G, capital G, this box right here. There's a one-half chance of capital G, lowercase g, because look, one-fourth, capital G, lowercase g, plus another one-fourth, capital G, lowercase g, gives us one-half, capital G, lowercase g. And then, of course, the final option would have been one-fourth chance of this guy in the corner right here, one-fourth, lowercase g, lowercase g. This gives us a very important ratio known as the one to two to one genotypic ratio. Do not forget this. This is how Mendel came to his conclusion of a 1 to 2 to 1 genotypic ratio. Box that in, star it, understand it. What we mean by this is that for every one homozygous dominant, there were two heterozygous, and then there was also one homozygous recessive. This is homozygous dominant, hom heterozygous, homozygous recessive. That's our genotypic ratio. One are going to be, this is one right here, coloring that in, that's our one. Then we have two of the same right here, lower key, capital G, lowercase g. So there's one, there's two, and then we have one final guy right over here called lowercase g, lowercase g, represented right there. Cross them all out, thus I've covered all of them. That's our genotypic ratio. The genes that come from a monohybrid cross will always, always, always come in this format, okay? as long as they're following Mendelian characteristics. That's sort of a nuance that we'll actually talk about in a future lecture. But now I want to finish the video by talking about the phenotypes. What good are all, is all this information unless we know what actually it looks like in sort of reality? What we end up happening, what ends up happening is that we get three green individuals, meaning that anybody in this sort of a Punnett square that I drew that had a capital G and something, it doesn't matter what, I'm going to put an underscore there, sort of like an empty box. Anything with a capital G will give us a green individual. I'll tell you, even though I crossed them out already, three times that opportunity came, thus there were three green individuals based off of our idea that green is dominant to the yellow recessive. But how many yellows were there? There were one yellow individual. And that guy was, by default, lowercase g, lowercase g. This gives us the world famous 3 to 1, not genotypic ratio, but phenotypic ratio. And that's another number, another ratio you should remember and understand how you get to it. For every 3 green, there's always going to be 1 yellow. 
anytime you have a monohybrid cross, a cross between a, an F1 individual and another F1 individual based off of this original true breeding parent line, you end up with these ratios every single time, so long as we're looking at basic Mendelian characteristics. This is finally overall referred to as a monohybrid. These both of these things are referred to, both ratios are referred to as monohybrid F2 phenotypic ratio. That is something you should know. You should think immediately this is the result of a true breeding parent line creating a heterozygous F1 line that is then crossed with itself as shown over here to give us a monohybrid F2 phenotypic ratio of 3 to 1 and also a monohybrid F2 genotypic ratio of 1 to 2 to 1. Overall, that covers Mendel's Model 2, and we'll continue our discussion on Mendelian characteristics in our next video.